You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. How's it going? Thanks for checking out my show, the Straight to Video Podcast, wherever you're listening from. It's a big week this week as this tiny little podcast, which you've been helping to grow, hits 70 episodes in just a few days. Can't believe we're at that number already, as it just seems like yesterday when we started. And I've got so many great guests lined up over the next couple of weeks, but we kick things off today in style as I finally got the chance to sit down and talk to the brilliant Roger Klein of Roger Klein and the Peacemakers. Now, I've been lucky enough to tour with Roger and his amazing band on a couple of occasions now, once in the UK and then back in 2019, they kindly invited us over to play the USA and do some shows with them from Arizona right up to Las Vegas, which really was a dream come true and they looked after us all so well. It was so cool to see them playing in front of their home crowds and get a taste of the passion, love and loyalty that follows this band around. Roger's journey, even before hitting the charts and MTV with the band The Refreshments, had already taken many twists and turns which we talk about during our chat. He recalls his time soaking up the influences of Mexico and Taiwan as a teenager before a passion for taking his love of punk rock and rock and roll to the next level saw him and his bandmates become an integral part of the huge Tempe, Arizona music scene which blew up in the mid-1990s. Now, the journey of the refreshments would last just two albums before record company shifts would halt the band's career, but it didn't stop Roger and bandmate P.H. Naffer from continuing on to form the much-loved Roger Klein and the Peacemakers, who scored a number one album on the Billboard Internet sales chart in 1999 with their debut Honky Tonk Union, a feat which was totally unheard of at the time. Such is the love and devotion of their fan base, which continues to this very day. Now, it was a lot of fun to speak to Roger all about his amazing journey, and he really is a great role model in the DIY ethic when it comes to being in a band in today's world. So I hope you enjoy it and take something away from his experiences for yourselves. If you'd like more info on Roger and his Peacemakers, then simply check out RogerKleinAndThePeacemakers.com, where you'll find all the info about the band, merch links, music, and you can even try out some of Roger's very own tequila. Thanks for the great support of this show too. Please check out all earlier episodes over at stvpod.com. You can grab the brand new STV logo share. And if you'd like to consider supporting the show just that little bit more, you can buy me a coffee with all donations going towards new equipment and any expenses that come with making and distributing the podcast. Every little bit helps and all the info is at stvpod.com. So, without further ado, sit back, maybe open a cold one, and enjoy my straight-to-video talk with Roger Klein. Rob. You too, mate. How you been? Confused and bored, irritated, complacent, lazy. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> I've been all right. I like staying at home for the most part. I'm getting the itch now, though. I'm ready to go out and do some shows. Hit a stage. Yeah. Yeah. PH and I, just two weeks ago, right before Texas completely froze, we went to Austin and Dallas and we did a couple of reduced capacity shows per day so that you could sort of make up the amount of money you need to make it viable. We went and it was it felt really, really good to be back on stage with a live audience. Like I forgot how good that feels. It's just a you know it, it's an indescribable feeling. And uh, I was once again, I was like college band nervous. Really? I was so nervous. Yeah, before we went on in Austin, I was like, Oh my god, I 
I've never, I haven't felt like this nervous since I was 19. It was great. I loved it. Well, I want to say thank you ever so much for taking some time to have a chat with me for the show. It's a total pleasure. I'm glad, I'm glad to see you again. I'm glad you're doing creative things, staying busy. So you've been working out on the ranch. That's been keeping you busy. How long has that been in your family? My grandfather bought it. I think he bought that ranch. My dad was about 12 and my dad's 78 now. So we'll back that out. I don't want to do the math. It's sometime in the late 40s, early 50s. Nice. So did your dad grow on there? On there the whole, yeah, basically the whole time. Yeah, he was, um, they, they had a ranch in Tombstone first. So my dad's at a Tombstone High School alumnus or alumni, that would be. Alumnus is singular, but if you use the Latin data, it's alumni. And that's what we all use, alumni. Anyway, so you know, vice president of my Latin, no, president of my Latin club. That's what a geek I am. Anyways, they traded a lot of really, really hard scrabble land in Tombstone for the ranch that we have now, which is about 40 miles west of there. And it's really beautiful. There's a huge drought going on though. And so, you know, literal drought for the cow people is, is difficult. It's sort of our analogous to our COVID drought, you know, so we're kind of going through the same thing. But to be chattier, um, the silver lining is I get to go back there and help get the ranch up to spec because he runs it all by himself and he's 78. I mean, and I'm no spring chicken either. It's not like we're kicking ass, but we're fixing some pipe and we're stretching wire and we're moving the herd and we're getting it done. So you didn't actually grow up on there. Your dad had another career prior to what he does now? Or? He lived on the ranch as he grew up. Then he went to college. Then he got jobs like kind of cowboying and, and ranching here and there as he moved away from the ranch. But then later, as my grandfather got sick, he returned in his, you know, he's, he's a young man and basically has been running it since then. And then my grandfather passed and my father's been running it since. And then just recently, my grandmother passed. And so he's the, the ranch man. It's his place. Yeah. How did you enjoy that growing up? Did you live in more of like a suburban area? Yeah, yeah. My parents got a divorce. So I was, I was more like, spent most of my time, the majority of my time, probably 60% in suburbia with my mom because they split custody, but I would spend summers and then weeks helping at the ranch. So I was very familiar with it. I know all the, all the stuff you're supposed to like, like riding and, and gathering herd and stuff. But until I turned about 25, I just loathed it. It was just a chore to me, you know? So when my kids were of the age, dad, let's go to the ranch and ride horses. I was like, no, fuck those things, man. They're just nasty. Anyway, I didn't uh, steal the horse experience from them. They, they're very good riders now, but I looked at it differently until now. I'm like, well, you know, this is quite a privilege to be, uh, be a rancher in the West in America now. Do you think it kind of taught you some early work disciplines, which you didn't perhaps realize at the time? Oh, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Work and, and ethic for sure. Like, you know, always true to your word, borrow something, you return it in as good a shape or better than you borrowed it promptly. These are hard and fast rules with clients. You're, there's no such thing as a lie. It's completely out of our vocabulary. And nobody's allowed to lie or admit a truth. And, you know, always work harder than the guy next to you and never leave work for somebody else. You know, just always do more than you can. Work from dark to dark means before sun up to after sundown. Those are things that, that were really inculcated to me and my brother and my, my dad and his uncle and everybody. It's just a Klein thing. Yeah. What was the response when you said you wanted to do the, is it the Klein country camp out, which you do? My dad has been sort of egging me on to do it for some time. He's a really gregarious, charming person. He's got his own way about him. He just knows how to basically charm anybody in the most indescribable way. And whenever my fan base comes in contact with my father, somehow my father steals my spotlight. A little bit bitter about that. So I was trying to keep, not really, but I told him I don't want to do that. I'm like, you're going to steal my fan base, dad. Come on, let's do it. So we did it. We did it the first time and the fan base was amazingly grateful and it went off really well. And I think now we're going to keep doing it as one of our destination shows. Like it'll probably happen once a year, maybe twice, but it's super fun. Everybody just pulls up in their, what do you call them? Caravan, right? Here it's an RV or a tent. And we have this pasture. We cleared about 40 acres and everybody just has a parking spot and they can make their campfire and everybody sets up their grills and, and their bars. And pretty much everybody's conscientious about their noise. Like nobody keeps the music on too late. Like they go back into the barnyard, which is almost always open for the big bonfire. We have a 30 pallet bonfire. Just have a hoot of it. It's a ball. And of course, my father's the one who gets the gift. So, you know, <laughs> he's got it figured out. Yeah, he gets no BS. Like in the barn, there are, he calls the barn now his booze boutique. It's a bring your own booze thing because it's a great savings for the concert goes. I don't have to buy $12 beers, right? But um, he would just hold court in his barn at a hay bale bar and would just pass, you know, tequila and beer back and forth and just shut the shit with everybody. And lo and behold, he charmed everyone. And he's got this basket of photos and like keychains and custom koozies and, and coffee mugs that were sent to him. With his picture with somebody else, like, like I got nothing. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Love it. 
<laughs> so was music always around you when you was growing up? Because I think you said you was into like punk rock. That was an early influence for you, right? I was. Punk rock is like I said, I was, you know, kind of grew up in suburbia and on a ranch. And there was a time where I was like, I will never pull cowboy boots on again, you know, because I, I just want to wear my Vans and ride my skateboard, you know, and listen to the Sex Pistols and the Lords of the New Church and, and you know, to get a little lighter, like early psychedelic first. I grew up listening to what my grandfather, my grandmother, and my father were listening to, which was traditional sort of country western stuff, like um, stuff you would definitely know would be Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, that kind of genre, you know, Waylon Jennings. And after a while, it drove me crazy. You know, I just didn't like it when I started to become a teen. Then I found punk rock and it saved me. And I found a skateboard and yeah, oh yeah, loved it. Do you remember any particular song where he's like, holy shit, what's that? That sounds totally different. Oh, when I heard Nevermind the Bullocks for the first time, you know, I remember where I was sitting, you know, I was in a friend's house who had a turntable and his parents were gone. He had like, check this out turned it on and was like, okay, this is something. This is a new religion. Nothing like you'd heard before. Nothing. No, there was nothing like it. And then from there, I kind of drifted into the American punk scene, which was all full of acronyms like DOA and JFA. And, and then there was Black Flag. And so I kind of got into that. Didn't go real like what they called hardcore at the time. I still liked a melody and good songwriting. The bad brains were about as far as I could get into the speed punk dealio. But yeah, I was a punk rock fan. I think it kind of bleeds through in my music like i got a punk rock ethic and it's a weird combo with the rest of my band because none of those guys know boo about it like deep as they can get it's like i don't know when we do cover sets i'm almost picking obscure punk songs and they're like what is this i've never heard of it where do you all meet then what's the kind of middle ground i don't know like if you listen to it that's kind of where we meet i guess that's the byproduct of my johnny cash sons of the pioneers willie nelson sex pistols lords of the new church meets what is ph like you know he's like he's definitely american rock and roll like meat and potatoes child and wood nick is a he's an obscure person he, he's a guy who turned me on to spoon he likes all sorts of stuff that i've I, I had never even heard of he listens to a lot of hip-hop very big into r&b so it all just mixes in there jim dalton listens also to everything but is a huge he's got deep roots in the 80s yeah so that you throw that all in shake it up and let it overflow and that's what we sound like was there a place or a person that kind of exposed you to new bands maybe a friend with recommendations or such as the one who played you the sex pistols or was there like record stores where you took a gamble on an album cover all the above you know in high school is really a kind of I think where a lot of people start to find their musical identity. And I think, you know, I'm older than you, but back in the day, people used to identify with a genre, right? Now people are genre agnostic and they like everything, which is what I've evolved to. And I, I appreciate that very much. But back in the day when, you know, when you were a punk, you'd listen to your punk friends. We would sneak into Zia Records or what's called Tower Records and just go through the vinyls. And sometimes it was as simple as liking a cover, you know, I'm going to spend seven dollars on this thing and trying it out. And sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you force yourself to like it because you'd spent those seven dollars on it. True. I know this is sacrilege, but I remember buying the church's first record and I'm, I'm supposed to like it. Right. Put it on. I'm like, oh, man, I'm sleeping through this. I just didn't like it. And so I, I think I sold it to one of my friends. It was your peers. And then the record store was a key, very, very important library, an important, you know, gathering place and an important place to find all these things. And of course, you could ask the hipster at the counter what they thought or if you were lucky they'd say oh that's a good choice yeah or pull a face when you put it on the counter mm, not that one <laughs> yeah like you cross your arms you're gonna write that yeah i thought spring session now by the missing persons was gonna be the shit which it is actually it's awesome what was the first concert you attended once you like into music like i want to buy a ticket and go and see this band I recall very clearly it was at a place called Legend City, which is defunct. It's gone now in Phoenix next to the zoo. I got to see the police headlining their Ghost in the Machine tour with the Go-Go's opening. I was just about to say the Go-Go's. I've just watched the documentary where it talks about them going on oh, yeah? tour with the police. Yeah. It was crazy how much the t-shirts cost. But I remember seeing the kids in junior high come back from concerts with their t-shirts and I always wanted one. So I worked extra hard, saved my allowance, and I got a Ghost in the Machine t-shirt. And it had, you know, had all the those digital things the representations of sting Stewart, and andy and there were glow in the dark around them and i think i paid 20 bucks 20 20 us dollars but man i wore that thing everywhere it was definitely a point of pride how big was the place they played was it a theater or it was a small outdoor amphitheater if i had to guess people in attendance it seems bigger probably in my memory than it really was but it's probably about 1500 people kind of not a giant but you know for the police and the go-go's to draw 1500 people in phoenix arizona was a big yeah. deal you're a popular Band. We were just a little kind of a cow town. Now we're in the millions. We're one of Arizona's biggest city and one of America's too. So 
How many of you went to the show? Was there a bunch of you? Let's see. It was me and a couple of friends. It was like, you know, parents dropped us off. So a couple of gals and a couple of guys, probably four of us, you know, and I was unprepared for what the culture would be like, but it was absolutely mind blowing. You know, it was hypnotizing. I would imagine like everything's kind of ingrained in that first gig. I can remember my first show. It's like when the lights go down and all that. Was it anything like you expected? No, I didn't know what to expect. So it was just such a rush, you know, it was such a thrill to watch the lights go down and the cheers go up. And then the old place smells like pot smoke. The crush of people running to the front of the stage. I didn't do that because I was a fan, but I was, you know, 13 or something. I just didn't have the courage yet to do that, you know, that everybody ran towards the front of the stage. And I remember it opening up in the back and I was still pretty close to the artists i think the main stage i was maybe 35 40 yards it was a, a huge thrill i remember being blown away by how loud it was because i don't think to that point we'd ever heard anything like that you never expected for like the full pa experience yeah with that with the bass hitting you in the chest it was so great love it has there been any bands which you've seen as a fan and i'm thinking more in the early days that kind of embodied the concert vibe which you've managed to create with the peacemakers because there's a certain vibe at your shows with the camaraderie and the good time vibe. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying. I try not to get too self-aware of that because I don't want to become a parody of myself. But I don't know. You know, I, I wasn't a fan of, of this artist. And this is sort of, you know, sacrilege to say this, but I wasn't really a fan of Bruce Springsteen until way later. I was already in bands in college before I discovered how he connected with the audience. And I was like, that's congregational. That is almost, you know, almost evangelical moment and I was like if I could just take a sliver of that and marry it with the punk rock pretense I might find myself and so if you took Johnny Lydon and Bruce Springsteen and married them together you might have something of what of what I was shooting for you got heavily into music and you go into shows at what point did you decide to take steps to either join or form a band because you were pretty shy growing up right super shy in high school like I didn't say anything till college like it was weird how quickly I opened up I remember I was overseas when I did I was in Mexico Spanish immersion program but that's another story I was really really quiet and shy in high High school, which makes this somewhat ironic, my friends who were like my soccer mates, right? We played on the soccer team. They wanted to form a band. And there was always one guy in high school who was the guitarist, right? And he said he would come play with us. I didn't play an instrument. Actually, I played piano, but very poorly. I had lost all my theory and my touch. The band sounded really good. And I wasn't really there to play but there was no vocalist. Nobody would step up. And there was a microphone and I just and a little box PA. And I can't remember what this band was playing. It was nothing I even liked very much because these guys were heavy metal guys. They were playing, shoot, man, there was that heyday of heavy metal in America. And so I think this was a docking song. And I happened to know it by being exposed to these guys by having to share rights to the soccer matches. So I stepped up and Don Dawkins got a huge high register and I don't, but I freaking tried. And they're like, you're the vocalist, you sing. And I was terrible at it, but I started trying and that's that's kind of where it went. And then the next step was I felt really shy, awfully naked without something in front of me. Everybody else had drums, bass, guitars, keyboards. So um, I borrowed a guitar, plugged it in and tied it to the handle of an amplifier so I could have something to hang around my neck. That led to me actually taking that guitar home and learning a thing or two, which led to, you know, learning other people's songs and then starting to work my own. And that's kind of how it evolved little by little. Did you find yourself reverting back to those original records that your parents were playing as songs to learn? Yeah. Finally, I was like, yeah, hey, you know, there was a time when that music had sort of a renaissance, a resurgence here in America. And Willie Nelson made a record called Teatro and Johnny Cash was signed to shoot. He did all those solo records and he became this almost a punk rock icon, you know, the American independent, you know, singer songwriter who never he did all the drugs and did all the, you know, all that stuff and, and lived through it. And now he's a God fearing guy. Whether that was important to me doesn't matter. But those artists started to become, in a way, punk rock. And so I started and wanting to do those songs again, like a vast version of On the Road again or Folsom Prison Blues and stuff like that. And every once in a while, they still end up in our sets. But those tunes actually came back around full circle. Or maybe I just woke up. They were always that cool. But started trying to pitch those to my bands that I was trying to form and lead. And, you know, that's just a shit show. But that's also another story. Thank God there was no internet then because, I mean, all of those mistakes would have been memorialized, right? Oof. So glad that there were only cassette tapes and phonographs and even the big digital cameras, remember, that used to go on our shoulders. Those were really rare. You had to have 800 bucks and those giant VHS tapes. 
there aren't many many of those videos around thank god because man i was in some crappy bands not to say that i was a good part of a crappy band i was probably a crappy part of a crappy band it's all part of the ladder it's all part of the ladder it is i'm just really glad it wasn't you know all over social media because that stuff is you know memorialized forever you mentioned briefly there you spent some time in mexico as in a spanish immersion class was that kind of your first taste of mexico because you've got like obviously got a very strong bond with the country I do. It was and it wasn't. I had a lot of exposure to Mexico because of the proximity to Mexico from the Klein Ranch. We're about 12 miles, more or less, from the border. So when I was a kid, we would share goods and labor with the locals. So like the border, as it is now, was nothing. There was basically kind of a guard shack and you'd just get waved through. And my family knew families on the other side of the border and we would we'd share saddles and labor. Like the vaqueros would come up to the ranch and help us gather for a week and we'd pay them and feed them. We'd all sleep in the same bunkhouse and barn. You know, I learned probably my first swear words from doing that. I remember where I got my first swig of tequila was behind the barn with these vaqueros. I was very familiar, had no, no bad feelings at all about it. It was just our sister country you know, it's cool. And I still do not. When I was screwing around in college, so fast forward, whatever, 15, many years, I was looking for a way to just extend my program of study because my band was starting to work. And like college became a shelter, a safe harbor to have a band and bang around the clubs. So summer comes and nobody's in Tempe, Arizona. And so the clubs are basically dead. Anyway, I found through the anthropology department that I could go to Mexico and live there in Ensenada for three months. Three months? Three months, yeah. Spanish immersion class. So I had a great teacher, a guy named Pedro, who was from Puerto Rico. He was a really, really good Spanish teacher. And I also had to do a concomitant or at the same time ethnography, which is study of living cultures for my anthropology course. So it was kind of a lot of study every day. It was probably four hours of Spanish, which was great. And then probably another four hours of ethnography where you had to go and quantify, which is difficult in anthropology, quantify behaviors. And so I remember when I had to choose my subjects, everybody was doing these really cool like important things like we're going to I'm going to study the Spanish library system or I'm going to study the Spanish mail system. They all seemed really important. And the only thing I could think of, and it was really natural, is like, I'm going to go hang out with the mariachis. And so that was my job. So I went and hung out with the mariachis and I learned a whole bunch of traditional music and where it comes from and when they sing it, and what it means to them. And I learned to sing it. And that's when you listen to my music, that's where it started to really seep in. And so I bought a lot of cigarettes and a lot of tequila to get these guys to sit down and let this 21 year old try to ask them questions in crappy Spanglish, you know, but they warmed up to me and I got to run the circuit with them around the Malacan and go to all those legendary places where they sang like uh, Papas and Beer and Husong's Cantina and all those places that were there then. So that's where I was first exposed to the resonance of mariachi music and I brought that forward into our whatever that shake it up and let it overflow rock and punk thing is that we do. With you saying that way, you had to gain their trust. Trust. I watched the David Arquette documentary recently. You know David Arquette, the actor. Yeah, I do. I don't know. He, uh, what's the documentary we're regarding? It's called "You Cannot Kill David Arquette." Cause apparently, about ten, fifteen years ago, he had a spot in WWE wrestling where they let him win the world championship title. He's like one hundred and twenty pounds soaking wet, isn't he? Yeah, and so when they did that, because like the wrestling fan base is like super loyal and they hate anybody taking the piss out of it, basically. Yeah. Ever since then, he's been a black cloud over WWE. So <laughs> in this documentary, he wants to wipe the slate clean. So he trains to become a wrestler again. And he goes to Mexico to fight with all the guys with the... The luchadors, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he has to kind of gain their trust and their respect. And they go out on, like, you know, where you get like people cleaning your windshields. Absolutely. The traffic lights. Yep. They do the actual wrestling there as well. So when the lights turn red, they'll do like a wrestling display. And he has to go and do that in front of all these cars. It's amazing. I will check it out. Yeah. It's so good. Wow. That's out of left field for sure. <laughs> Yeah, in a way I, I did. I had to, here I am, this gringo, this white kid, you know, privileged and wearing different clothes and, you know, coming to visit the country. My Spanish was not very good. I had two years under my belt and I could kind of get along, but it certainly wasn't yet conversational. And here I am trying to, to mesh with the mariachi culture, you know, and that and I'm writing things down. And I definitely got a cold shoulder at first. I mean, I lived with a Spanish family and I had, I would come home pretty frustrated. And the girls I lived with, they were really nice and they knew some of the mariachi people. And they said, so what we'll do 
is we'll go to where these mariachis take a break and you buy them the foosball game. There are these foosball tables where these guys would go and take a break. And so I'd put the pesos in and let them play and stay out of it. Next thing I know, I'm getting to play. Next thing I know, I bought a bunch of cigarettes and would just kind of pass them out. And so little by little, they thawed out. But it took, uh, it seemed like two weeks. It was probably a week to 10 days where until I could start to talk to them directly. And then they were like, come on in. And I got in with the main like alpha dog mariachi band. But they would take their breaks in this old auto parts garage and outside in the back was where they would do the mechanicing and they had a fire they would just sit around a fire on milk crates and this is totally not pc but they'd burn tires and just sit back there while they'd take their break and pass the bottle around and i remember sitting there trying to talk to these guys about you know can we talk about Guadalajara or can we talk about whatever these songs were and then finally i remember the, the bottle would go around but it would pass me and then the bass player this guy who played this big bajon he took the swig of the bottle and he hit me. He didn't look at me. He just hit me and he gave it to me and just kind of kept talking. And then from that moment, I was in as a, I don't know what they call it. There used to be a name I, would, I was conversing with. It's a, uh, shoot, it's got some name in anthropology and ethnography, but I was, I was in. That must have felt good. You were like, yes. Yeah. Then it fleshed out the rest of my paper really quickly. But for the first two weeks, it was difficult. Wow. Because um, you did that, but you also traveled to Taiwan at one point during college. I did. I went overseas for a summer. I had a, a good friend who had already been over there. And he, well, I'll put this in quotes. He taught English, right? It's kind of a well-known international, like, it's not a con, but it's certainly you're not really teaching English because I didn't speak a lick of Mandarin. Anyway, went over there uh, with $300 in my pocket. And at the time, this is back in the day when you could get a courier flight. If you would accompany a package through customs, and you didn't know what this package was. And this was early days of FedEx. You could get this important package through customs more quickly. So you became an escort for a package. We didn't know what was in our packages. Nobody. Yeah, it sounds really dodgy. Then. <laughs> yeah, we had to sign waivers and stuff. But at the same time, there was a protection on our side saying like, we escort this package but we can't take responsibility for what's in it you know there was this sort of a loophole anyway we got courier flights all the way over there one way found a room for six dollars a night at the taiwan hotel uh, no the taipei hostel and lived in total squalor and it was absolutely awesome got a job at a place called mecha where i luckily didn't have to teach english i was a, an american culture emissary to teach inbound taiwanese students about american culture and so i got a really really good job and i loved my students and it was fun and it was sort of performance Forming. You know, you try to mesh these cultures together, or at least get these kids not to be so shocked and so isolationist when they show up here. And I kept in touch with some of them later. And like, you were the best teacher, the best part, you know, of this. You took total all the crazy magic mystique that we were scared of about America away so that we could enjoy our experience. And that was really gratifying. Because wasn't there a plan to perform over there as well? Yeah, there, there was. It was just my roommates and me, and we were a crappy band. But we wanted to go over there and, yeah, play punk rock. And so we learned. What did we learn? We brought over a repertoire as a three-piece. We had Violent Femmes songs. We had Usual Suspects. We had, oh, Pixies. We knew a lot of Pixie songs. and A couple of Johnny Cash tunes. I think we tried an acoustic version of an, a Sex Pistol song, but didn't do it very well. I mean, as simple, as rudimentary as those songs are, their chord progressions and changes are like, wow, you did that and it works. It didn't work on acoustic guitar. But anyway, we, our big plan was to get in the clubs there. And that was our big plan to earn money. We we're just going to be musicians and, and have a great time. But the clubs were all shut down because of a new, a new policy where everybody had to have work permits. So there were no American bands around. So I literally took it to the underground. I ditched my band because they weren't inter interested in playing. And I took my guitar into the, the subways and started busking. Yeah. And I started out playing those songs and nobody responded. And then there's this Danish busker named Mickey. And he's like, all right, mate, let me tell you the secret. This country has been under martial law because of their conflict with China for 10 years, but it was just lifted. So they haven't heard a sad song because of part of martial law and how the ROC was going to shape their culture. They wanted only happy songs on the radio you got to learn you know sad sappy slow john denver songs everly brothers songs simon and garfunkel songs and this at the time was the antithesis of where i was i was gonna go anyway mickey kept coming home with bags of nt new taiwanese money and finally i'm like all right show me your repertoire and i sat down on the patio upstairs and it was just kind of a dirty squalid little balcony learned half a dozen of these songs and sure enough the dam broke and i started making like 60 bucks an hour so it started to sort of conflict with my real job anyway so i would find myself up do the first shift at mate john then i run over for the lunch shift in the tunnels and run back to mate john do the afternoon and then i run over for the rush hour and i was raking it in so i actually i didn't like taiwan as much as it sounds like a ton of fun it was just you turn this color called taipei gray after a while i turned taipei gray i was 
grumpy. I didn't like it. It was too crowded and too squalid and too ferociously commercial and impersonal. So I got out of there as quick as I could. So I took my bag of change and I left my roommates. So I went to Bali and left them in Taiwan. Oh, wow. Yeah, they joined me about three weeks later when they could earn enough money to get there. Bali's lovely. Yeah, I got lucky and I stayed in Kuta right before they finished the runway. So it was back at the time where there was nothing higher than a two-story building. There was a local zoning rule that no building could be higher than the palm tree. And it was that simple and that organic. And I've heard now to get around that developers just killed all the palm trees. Um, At the time, it was you know, open windows and papaya for breakfast and mushroom tea and surfing. It was great. Where do you think this kind of desire and open-mindedness to travel and embrace other cultures come from? Because the USA is so vast, many people don't even travel outside of America. A lot of Americans don't. They're kind of content within this massive place. But you seem like pretty open-minded from a fairly young age, like, yeah, I want to go and explore these places. I don't know exactly how to link that credit, but it probably comes from my mother. She was a teacher, believed in science and respected culture, you know, and she was an educator. So my mind was open to exploring and seeing, you know, how the world works, you know, and where where we got America, which is this, you know, big mess of every culture, right? So I wasn't afraid. And so I just got on a plane and did it. And I'm really glad I did then because I don't know if you could now. So you're at university playing in bands. Was there a tipping point whilst at university when you made the choice to give music a shot as a career? Yeah, like I said, I used university as sort of safe harbor for a while after my band started getting good. And it was mostly, there was a band called The Mortals that I had that was a three-piece, more definitely more in the punk rock zone. Started to get a little following and then it broke up. And I went back to study and I, I just crammed and basically filled out my uh, my curriculum so that I could graduate. Actually, the university almost forced me to do that. And I applied to grad schools and got my advocate at ASU to to send my statement of intent off. And I got accepted to a couple of places. But then I had a choice. At the same time that summer, the refreshment started to form. And just messing around, it had a click. We started seeing crowds showing up. And I was, this is even better than it was before, even more of a buzz. And I'm actually making $400 a week. You know, this was something. And so what I did is when I was supposed to go to, I think it was CSULB, California State University in Long Beach, for my study, I asked to defer my course of study. And I, I made some horse shit up about travel and doing, a, I can't remember some, I totally lied to the university. You know, after I said that, it's a like core thing, clients don't lie. I just said, I'm, I'm going to go off and try to deepen my thesis or something. And they said, great, take a year. I may have even written that letter on from Taiwan, I think, because I was due to go back. And so I, I remember that letter went from Taiwan and then the next year, when it was time to time to go back to school, I was in Mexico, not for the ASU course of study, but I was just messing around down there. So I sent them another letter and asked if I could defer again. And they quickly responded back. I would have to call home and have my brother check the mail because he was my roommate. And I said, anything back from CSULB? I said, yeah. And I said, open it. And I remember he said, no, you have to take your seat this semester. So that was when I had to make a choice. And music was just too, it had me. You know, I, was, I was already, yeah, the muse had already kissed me on the cheek and I was, I was stumbling, following her and took the road less travel and that has made all the difference when was the first time you recall there being like let's say the tempe music scene as things became really popular with yourselves the jim blossoms dead hot work sharp all with this sound which was going around do you remember when you recall things kind of starting to bubble around there was that around a similar time it was around the similar time. There was a seri- there was a, a few years. I'd say there were the heyday was probably half a dozen years when it was really I credit the gin blossoms and the university and the clubs all had their had this symbiosis where these divey clubs where the college kids wanted to go. They were really authentic. It was before downtown mill gentrified. These were some scary clubs. And the the kids, you know, I was one of them wanted to go in and experience this life. And the gin blossoms were in there and they appealed to the college kids, the workers, the bikers, everybody, because they were amazing and they were honest and the songwriting was was top notch. What year would this be? I would guess that was about 1993. Okay. I would look when the Gin Blossoms put out a record, it's kind of their indie record called Dusted. It was like right when things were starting to hit that, like you say, tipping point where the fuse was lit. That's when it started. And then probably six six to 10 years later, that's just kept going. And every artist was sleeping on every every other artist's couch and playing either, every other artist's songs, you know, and opening for every other artist. It was really quite incestuous in, in a good artistic way. And it, it just galvanized the attention of the university, which was massive at the time. I think it was 40,000, maybe, maybe pl- probably between 25 and 40,000 people. It keeps growing. It's now it's 120,000 or something, but everybody would pack into these divey little bars with crappy sound systems and, and hang out and rub elbows with people 
who weren't like them, but you shared a love of music. And that was, it was almost like I used the word before, it was a religion. It was like, we are all gravitating towards this light that is coming from the stage. And it was an amazing feeling. Was it a reaction to anything, do you think, that style of music at all? As an artist, not for me, no. I think that it was just, there's this jangly desert sound happening. It sounded like the right kind of accent for Arizona. May have heard like Texas music sounds a certain way or stuff from, you know, Arkansas and the Southeast sounds a certain way. I think there was just an emerging identity and we were all a part of it. And it seemed like you could do no wrong. Any syllable you added to the paragraph seemed to fit. And it was just a really cool thing. Yeah, it was very, very inclusive. Experimental for sure, but nothing was omitted. It was really cool. For me over here, because I was like a big Jim Blossoms fan, it was just alternative enough, but still enough pop sensibilities. And traditional American rock and roll is in there too, but you can you can hear their accent. You know, it's really cool. How was it networking between all of you back then, pre-internet and promoting shows? Was it like a local radio station? Yeah, record stores again uh, would allow us to you'd go in and ask them if they would spin your demo or spin your, at the time it was cassette, you know. Uh, we would go to the college radio station and beg for any amount of time on, on air and they were looking for content. So we got a lot of airplay from them. What else would we do? I made flyers and illegally, you know, go to a, what we have this uh, photocopy store back in the day. It was called Kinko's. I've heard about that from the Hollywood scenes. <laughs> yeah, go in, in the middle of the night and just make a whole bunch of flyers and then take a staple gun on your bicycle and go to the university and there's these giant wooden kiosks. And you're not supposed to do this, but we would do it, bam, 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 pepper the whole campus with your with your gig and hope somebody would, would come. So really, really brick and mortar kind of basic. You just hit the ground running stuff is what we did. Tell all your friends, ask the club if they'll knock a buck off the cover if somebody brings in a flyer, that kind of thing, you know, and it, it would work. And then the most important thing is just put on a fucking good show. You know, make sure that everybody went there, wanted to come next week. And we had a, the refreshment set up a little mantra that said, we will play anywhere, anytime for anyone, for anything. And like, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty inclusive. And we pretty much did that. We went from trying to get, you know, a gig a month to having, I remember there were months where we had almost no time off, maybe one Monday. And I'd have to take it from my voice. So we just would try to be really fun. Beer was a big part of it. We just kind of cheer, cheerlead the drinking a little bit. And the college kids fell right in line. How was it seeing like the Jim Blossoms catching on, not just national, but worldwide as well? It was amazing to see the guys I knew on David Letterman, who they were just there at Long Wong's. Wow, it was it was mind blowing. And they just seemed like the home team. Of course, there's some people who you know have, were critics or sour grapes. But like for the most part, the entire community was like, they they did it. They did that. So it was a real thrill to watch that happen. And then, of course, it opened up that, wow, if they can do it, maybe we can do it. And so I think it made all the rest of the band sort of up their game. One, believe in what they were doing. And two, go, all right, well, here's where we can make improvements, you know, musically, artistically, you know, in terms of public performance, all that stuff. Because was it like South by Southwest, which you did, which kind of opened some doors with record labels for you? Yeah, just today. So Friday is going to be the 25th anniversary of The Refreshments, my first record's first release. So anyways, we got invited by the local newspaper. We were there in Dorsey for Arizona or Phoenix, Arizona to go to South by Southwest. And just today I was looking for the article that we got and I found it. I could in two seconds, I could probably go get it. Actually, it's on my phone because I was going to do a post. Hold on one sec. So check this out. We got into an ASCAP showcase. So we were up at a place called the Aquarium at midnight, which I thought was going to be a terrible terrible showcase but we had a buzz and it was because the austin chronicle gave us a pick back in the day if you were picked by a music critic as like an up-and-comer this was called uh sleepers and scorchers or something like that some column but check this out and see if my old eyes can read this amongst a whole bunch of other bands it says this the refreshments the proof that fabled desert bands parentheses thin white rope sidewinders giant stand etc of the mid 80s planted some seeds Ragged harmonies, wiry guitar figures, etc. Though their vocalist is much more confrontational, i.e. in your face. <laughs> so that was our, our pick. Yeah, take that. Yeah, I love it. Totally will take that. That was my punk rock thing coming through. I'm like, yeah, somebody sees it. Wasn't you performing at the same time as the presidents of the USA? I think we followed them, which was really intimidating because they had a buzz already. And I kind of heard them in the underground scene. Cake, I think, was there too. Anyways, we watched them play and I was like, oh, I don't want to follow that, but it's the best thing for you, right? When you see a band like that that just leaves the stage burning, you're like, okay, I got an A game. Let's do this. You know, With only about four strings between them all. <laughs> yeah, oh, they lit it up. And I thought, I'm like, well, 
I, when I went in there, you know, you have your little wristband and your badge, right? I could barely get in the door. I remember this. I had my one of my first brushes with greatness. There was a producer named Butch Vig, American producer, walked by and like kind of pushed by me and stepped on my foot. I didn't know who it was. What was the name of his band? Garbage. That was it, Garbage. And he walked by and stepped on my boot. And guy next to me was probably Buddy or Brian because I wasn't paying attention. But that was Butch Vig, dude. Who? Like, later, later, I was like, oh, Butch Vig stepped on my foot. But I thought the place would clear out. It was packed for that show. And I'm like, this is going to suck. We're going to have a showcase. Place is going to file out. And it didn't. Everybody stayed. So I remember when we walked up and we had our 35 minute showcase. I was like, holy shit. I'm not sure it's better that it's packed or if everybody would have left. I was so racked, but it worked out. A good response. Really good place lit up. Yeah. Would you say that the rise and success of the refreshments was fairly fast compared to some other bands who have maybe been around for many years before any label interest? I mean, some bands are around for like 10 years. It certainly was, you know, to use the word that the right writers all say is meteoric, you know, which is, seems to me to be the reverse of the way it should be. But yeah, it was really quick. It was quite the trip from our founding and putting out our first demo in December of 94 through our signing in spring, fall of 95. Wow. And then our release, our first release in February of 96. And then the subsequent, you know, getting on MTV and, and hitting all the charts and then doing another record. It was really fast. It was a fun ride. It was just amazing how quickly it would go. It was dizzy. This is probably a totally random thought from me but do you think that made the decision to continue after the band left their label a little easier for you and ph because you're kind of like well we did it within a couple of years we can just do it again with a new band was that any kind of conscious decision do you think i think that was probably in there if i have to be that introspective i didn't think of it like that at the time but certainly if that was my history i probably would have believed it could be done again as such the one souring really souring aspect that made us walk away from the major labels was that our second record was just criminally ignored and and under curated by the shift in management that Mercury underwent at the time. They were sold to a conglomerate, I think it was owned at the time by Seagram's. And Seagram's wasn't in the music business. And then they chopped every head on the floor that we had come to have a relationship with, gave us a new AR person, unplugged our European, Japanese, and Australian tour, got rid of our singles. Mekong was split, stated to be a single, and just pushed us into the studio with very, very little input as to what producer we could have. We chose Paul Leary. I had a wonderful experience, but if I had to do over again, I probably would wouldn't have chosen him. I loved him because of his punk rock ethic. He was in the butthole surfers and made really weird sounding stuff, but I don't think he was the right choice at that time. Anyways, Mercury, basically, we went from being an artist to just a cookie cutter product. It was just a really stark distinction. It, we went from being very dear to people on the floor in the label to being just like, well, get out there and make a record, you know, and we didn't get to choose our single, whereas on the first record, we got to choose our single. We were out there and we knew we weren't prioritized at all because you could tell in retail, and at radio we had no presence whatsoever we could see it start to happen in the crowds because when you're not publicized you know you get your loyal core which was great to have but we were expected to be filling larger rooms by that time and i remember going to the will rogers theater in oklahoma city thinking there's just no way we're going to fill this up and it was true you know the refreshments of fizzy fuzzy big and buzzy had we gone on the same trajectory could have done it but bottom fresh horses just fell flat anyway that, that was sort of the beginning of the end that was the beginning of the end and then the end of the end i asked Ellie if there are any bands that influenced the outlook and vibe you create in a live environment but do you remember when it kind of actually started to blow up for you guys was it in the refreshments days or was it in peacemakers where you noticed this loyalty obviously when you put out the first peacemakers album it hit the number one spot on the internet chart so the loyalty was there but has that concert vibe always been there from the refreshment days it has yeah we we definitely kept that common thread where the public performance is is intimate no matter how many people are in the audience and you never get pull on your artistic shroud too much too often you know make a human connection through rock and roll and celebrate life together here now that was common thread for both bands. If there's one element that keeps it going, I think it's that and the honesty that we're grateful for this life way, this career, and we won't have it if people stop showing up. So we don't phone anything in. And that's why I take songwriting, which is usually an individual effort for me. Uh, I take it really seriously. And I, I'm meticulous about my songwriting and I probably take way too long editing. I'm not terribly prolific because I probably overcook my songs, but that's how we do it. When did you first cross paths with fellow Arizona resident Alice Cooper? Yeah. And when did you learn he was a fan? I remember specifically, I totally remember, it was during the Bottle of Fresh Horses tour. So we were on our second record and we had just done a tour and we came home to a place called Mesa Amphitheater where we were encouraged by a promoter who's still a friend of mine to begin a tradition, name it something, and we'll do this every year. 
we later took that idea and applied it to Mexico and maybe later we'll do it to the ranch. But we came up with this idea called the running of the bull, sort of loosely based on, you know, Pamplona, Spain. But instead of people running from bulls or we had a guy in a bull costume run through the crowd. Anyways, that was our little shtick, bit of irreverence and stupidity. But I was on the bus. We were going to go on to this crowd and my tour manager, he knocked and I remember he stuck his head in and said, hey, somebody's here to see you. We're going to go on in 20 minutes. And you know what it's like? You want that time? And on through the well of the bus walks Alice Cooper. And I, I remember thinking, that guy looks an awful fucking lot like Alice Cooper. I, I was in disbelief. I don't even know if I stood up, which is, you know, you definitely stand up. And he was like, I just wanted to meet you. You're I'm a huge fan. And he sat down comfortable and had no pretense. I was like, oh, my God. He's like, I love your records. And that's where that started. I was like, I've been listening to your records since I had to hide them. Like, you know, wow, it was amazing. So good. So have you crossed paths since then? Oh, yeah, totally. He gave us amazing shout outs. And there's a, a documentary on the on the life, the life and death of the refreshments called Here's to Life. And he's in that several times saying things that I probably should have paid him to say. But yeah, as a matter of fact, he has a charity or had a charity event that he holds in Phoenix called the Solid Rock. Uh, it's actually called Christmas Pudding, and it benefits a Christian organization that gives inner city youth programs and things to, to break out of poverty and self-defeating spirals. We played the very first one is his backing band play like one or two he would call us every year and then later on i found myself the quote entertainment director our band became the backing band for every artist so we played with like peter frampton man i wish i had the list we played with so many people rob zombie we had to learn this really diverse bunch of music was you just doing rock and roll standards or actually their songs their songs and what was the name of this band shoot man i i, I wish i would have prepared because we played with so many so many artists if you go back i'm sure you're there's some where you can say what artists were on the Christmas pudding what year. We, we were there, everybody's back in band. Everybody but Alice, he had his own band, which I was like, come on, dude. He came up and did like Banditos with us or something a couple of times. Oh, wow. But I wanted to do like, the first year we got to be his backing band. So we did Schools Out and we 18 and we were playing it with Alice on stage. It was badass. And he just showed up at our house to rehearse. He called me up and he's like, hey, I want to rehearse with you guys. Make sure we got these songs. But mostly it's not about you. I, I feel like I've seen your band and you got this. He said, what I want to do is two Two days before the show, I like to beat my voice up so that it heals by the time showtime is. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. And I've actually used that since then. So now before I go on the road, I try to throw in a, a way too intense rehearsal two or three days before we actually start taking stage. And it does miracles from the stamina of my vocals. Anyway, that's how I met Alice Cooper and how we became his house band and how uh, I became entertainment director for the Solid Rock Foundation and Christmas Pudding for 10 years. And then finally, the whole band was having babies and it always happened in Christmas. So it's incredibly busy and we were woodshedding and cramming all this diverse music and it was super stressful. So one year he called me up, it's probably, I don't know, September, October to say, hey, ready to do it again. I'm going to give you the, the list I'm curating. And I actually had to ask on behalf of the band, I'm like, Alice, we love you and we love the work you're doing and that we get to do with you and that privilege. But can we take a year off? He said... He goes, I thought you were going to ask me that after the first year. I can't believe you let you lasted this long. So it was really cool. Proper legend, proper legend. He is sure. a legend, yeah. So um, finally, to kind of wrap things up, I was wondering if there was a festival between, I know you've done a gig with one of these guys, if there was a festival with yourselves, Sammy Agar and Jimmy Buffett, whose fans do you think would be the rowdiest and most drunk? Because you all have that great party atmosphere. This is, is no disrespect. I think the Peacemakers would, actually. It's just because, uh, just because, because I've seen it. I mean, Jimmy I mean, Buffett bands, yeah, they're they're into the three chord mellow thing, and the hook is the same over and over, and they kind of get it's like the pop version of a jam band. Hagar's people, I've seen them, played with them before. They fire up and go hard out of the gate, and then like they burn out in about 25 minutes. Peacemakers will go for four hours, and I've seen it, and I still see it. So I'm pretty sure the peacemakers would carry the torch the longest, but everybody would share the light and have a ball. Nice one, awesome, Roger. Thank you ever so much, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved catching up with you, mate. Thanks ever so much for your stories. I'll let you go, but yeah. Yeah, loved it. Well, thanks for your time. Peace be with you.
Just the best to catch up and talk a while with the brilliant Roger Klein here on the Straight to Video podcast. I want to say a big thanks to Roger for taking the time to do that and sharing all his fun stories. As mentioned earlier, please visit rogerkleinandthepeacemakers.com where you can find all the info about the band and be a part of one of the most devoted fan bases I've certainly been lucky enough to experience. Such a good time had by everyone involved, which is pretty darn infectious. I will speak to you all real soon on episode 70 of the Straight to Video podcast. Can't wait to share that one with you. But in the meantime, don't forget to check out and support the show over at stvpod.com. But till then, please look after yourselves and I'll catch you all real soon. Mm-hmm.